Well, thank you for those uh, very kind words. Uh, I was um, quite keen to take this opportunity to say a few things here at the Crawford uh, School. Uh, I, have, I'm, I guess I'm sort of old school in the sense that uh, I sort of believe that secretaries should not be either seen or heard, uh, <laughs> by and large. And I have, uh, in fact, resisted uh, every, every um, invitation to, to speak, but as has already been pointed out, I, I am a, a firm believer that uh, there does need to be you know, a healthy, productive and creative exchange between the Australian public service and uh, academia. And it always seems strange to me that, uh, that there shouldn't be a sort of vibrant, productive relationship between the ANU and the Australian public service uh, on public policy. I mean, just proximity uh, should have, you would have thought, uh, have led uh, to you know, quite an engaging set of relationships uh, between the two uh, institutions uh, uh, that should be well-founded and well-organised. And I, I was a little surprised that, uh, that um, things hadn't really changed that much in the decade or so while I was away. So uh, I've been pleased to you know, participate in that and, uh, and I'm keen for the department to encourage uh, not only the exchange of views from uh, uh, from the university, but I've also felt that uh, there needed to be uh, a two-way movement that uh, people from the department and from the public service in general needed to uh, you know, make themselves available and participate in uh, in the workings of the ANU itself. So on that basis, I thought, uh, notwithstanding my general reluctance to, uh, to say things in public, uh, I thought uh, on this occasion, because of the Crawford School, that I would say a few things. Now, I thought that uh, the way it would be best to organise things this evening would be that uh, uh, if I set the scene, um, my topic is the productivity agenda in the department, uh, I see a very close link between those two, uh, two, two events or two concepts. I'm not quite sure whether you can think of the department as a concept. I guess you probably can. Uh, but I thought that would be, uh, I would set the scene, uh, and draw your attention, I think, to some of the sort of the key uh, variables and some of the key aspects of the department, and then I'd be very pleased to, to take questions. So let me just start with this chart. Now, productivity, this is sort of getting to the, to the heart of it. Um, this is gross value added per hour worked in the market sector. It's an ABS concept. But look, it's fair to say that uh, while productivity is much discussed, it is probably poorly understood. Uh, for those who've delved into this particular area, it is a complex, arcane area. And uh, for most people, delving a little is probably enough. And uh, unfortunately, it's one of those areas where experts, I think, find themselves doomed to talk to other experts because most people find it very difficult to either understand or after they start to understand why they should become an expert in this particular area. Now, I mean, at one level, it's a simple concept. I mean, productivity is simply just output per unit of input, but it only takes uh, a very short space of time to realize that uh, once you start talking about all the inputs you need to involve capital, uh, and once you start thinking about capital, it becomes a complex issue of how do you measure it. And then when you're challenged to put capital and labor together, it becomes even more challenging as to you know, how, you should, uh, how you should actually functionally put them together to get output. And at that stage, others will suggest that, well, maybe it's very difficult to conceive of a production function that actually makes sense at a, at a macro level. So why don't we start to think about uh, production functions at a sectoral level, at a firm level, and once you start aggregating that, you can imagine why it is a complex and arcane area. So you can understand why um, people tend in this uh, sort of area to focus on something that you can at least get your hands around and can think about, and that's labor productivity. That's just output per unit of labor input. Uh, the ABS has put uh, quite a lot of uh, resources into to measuring this concept. This is, in fact, what we see I've charted here. Uh, this is quarterly data. The, the, um, the ABS, uh, there's a break in the series. The data only goes back as far as September quarter 94. So I'm an old traditionalist as well. I'm, I think it's a, a good thing just to get the data out and have a look at it. And 
one in this area immediately becomes uh, aware of the fact that uh, all sorts of conclusions can be drawn depending on the, uh, on the timeline, the baseline, the period under analysis, and all sorts of uh, conclusions can be drawn. So my general attitude to this, um, it's good to put trend lines through things that uh, you know, can make things clearer. But uh, I think one should always be humble when it comes to drawing conclusions about trend lines and particularly trend lines which appear to change. I think uh, a good rule of thumb uh, when uh, drawing conclusions about changes in trend is that there does need to be a compelling structure on uh, theory or structural explanation as to why uh, there is a particular change in the trend line. So here we have the, the entirety of the, uh, the ABS uh, quarterly uh, labour productivity numbers. Uh, a moment's thought tells you that it's hard to measure productivity in the public sector, so the ABS just focuses on the market sector. Well, looking at this chart and the, and the, and the trend lines, there's obviously... Hmm, I don't know if I'm actually going to add anything with my, my laser pointer. Oh, there we go. Uh, this period here, which runs from uh, September 94 all the way up to uh, the first quarter of 2004, there appears to be a, a you know, very tight and you know, reasonably uh, coherent trend line which uh, gives a productivity rate of growth for labour productivity of 2.7%. Now, 2.7% is uh, historically very robust for Australia. It's a, it's a good, solid number. Uh, it's tempting. I mean, people confronted with this would be say, well, look, that must be due to uh, the reforms of the 80s and 90s. Uh, that's the, that's the uh, reform dividend, so to speak, that lasts from here to here. Uh, but um, for anyone who's sort of delved into this area, it's clear that uh, there are other things going on uh, through this period. People have drawn attention to the fact that uh, a large chunk of the, uh, of the productivity growth through this period, particularly when we start looking at a firm level or sectoral level, uh, is in the services sector and appears to be closely uh, related to you know, large-scale investment in ICT. And people will also notice and comment on the fact that uh, during this same period, uh, a lot of developed countries saw uh, a, resur a resurgence and actually something of a uh, of a above trend growth in productivity. So there's a, a temptation to say, well, the other things may not be as important as the, the reforms of the 80s or 90s itself. Now, I think with all these things, there's a danger of uh, once you start to think of, well, there are other explanations throwing out the, the core insta insight that does actually come from this uh, particular period. And I think it's, uh, it's reasonable to also focus on the fact that uh, a lot, of, a lot of that, I mean, during this period, there was a, a lot of change built around uh, the notion that uh, Australia should internationalise itself, that Australian industry should be exposed to international prices, that this was a surefire way to uh, encourage uh, competitive behaviour, but also to encourage, uh, you know, higher rates of growth of productivity. This was the dismantling of the, of the industrial tariff and the uh, floating of the dollar through deregulation of the financial sector. Now... It's also true during this period that there was a heightened interest in competition in the non-traded goods sector as well. The notion that during this period was that uh, if you put enough pressure on, 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 the, on the traded goods sector and then there would be pressure on all the uh, service providers uh, throughout the economy. So during this period, there wasn't just pressure on the traded goods sector, there was uh, an active encouragement of competition through utilities, electricity, uh, but just generally there was a, a, an economy-wide interest in, in competition, which uh, makes Australia different from a lot of countries where uh, they're highly, uh, highly competitive and productive in the, in, the, in the traded goods sector, but their services sector is, uh, is very much a sheltered workshop. And the other interesting thing during this period is that uh, Australia moves up the league tables. I mean, the OECD league tables, Australia starts to uh, move up from sort of the bottom quartile to the top quartile. And for those with a historical bent, uh, this actually reverses probably a hundred years decline in Australia's relative performance. So I think it's reasonable to conclude that whereas there is uh, a lot of other things going on during this period, which leads to higher productivity growth, it's reasonable to base uh, 
the extent of the recovery in Australia and the fact that it is really quite a marked break from what's been going on before uh, to, to the reform agenda of the 80s and 90s. Now the second period is the period that people start to uh, become rather concerned about what is happening to productivity in Australia. And uh, I found it quite intriguing that uh, this, the dates of this, it's uh, the first quarter of 2004 to the third quarter of 2008, that straddles uh, two events. At the beginning of 2004, Australia experiences quite an extraordinary uh, lift in its terms of trade. I mean, like nothing we've seen, oh, like nothing we've seen in the data. Uh, extraordinary period. And the third quarter of 2008 is, of course, the, uh, the collapse of, of, of Lehman Brothers. Now, this period in Australia is, is a wonderful period of, for growth, for, for wealth, uh, for the stock market, for house prices. And as we'll see a bit later on, there's a very marked lift in the participation rate. Uh, more and more people are actually drawn into employment during this period. And uh, simple arithmetic tells you that uh, if you've got a lot of labor and not that much output, uh, then obviously productivity growth is, is much lower. And then there's this third period, which I found particularly intriguing because uh, sort of the broad, <coughs> the broad analysis, the broad debate is very much about uh, Australia's declining rate of growth of productivity uh, and its continued decline. And so it, it struck me that uh, once <coughs> you break this period into three, there appears to be the basis of, uh, of, a, of a recovery in productivity growth, which dates again from... Uh, from the third quarter of 2008 and the collapse of Lehman Brothers. So, you know, numerology is a, is a fine and wonderful art, but you wouldn't really want to conclude that there are three distinct periods in that uh, unless you had some, some structural um, uh, reason to believe that there is some reason to see a recovery here. And you could think of some off the top of your head notions why productivity might have recovered, or you, you may have just said, well, this period was an unusual period here, but it was depressed by the resources boom, by enormous investment in the mining sector, and this was probably a more um, sort of underlying rate. Uh, but then I was struck by, um, by a paper that um, Ben Dolman and David Gruen uh, earlier this year brought out, which focused on uh, productivity at a firm level. There is actually quite a, an entrenched or quite an elaborate uh, part of the literature, uh, which is even more, for some I suspect, arcane and difficult to, to come to grips with, which is constructing production functions at a, uh, at a uh, sectoral or firm level. And, but the conclusions from that, and when you pull all the international research together and the Australian research, is that there's a reasonable compelling case to say that somewhere between a fifth and a half of labour productivity growth is actually due to net entry of firms. In other words, uh, at all points in time, there are uh, new companies, new businesses being set up, and there are um, old companies exiting. So the notion that the churn of uh, businesses actually leads to you know, a large part of the growth in productivity, I found an intriguing one. And they also drew attention to the fact that uh, Innovating companies, companies which appear to be, well, the companies which are actually doing clever things in terms of the way they organize themselves or the products that they sell, appear to be linked to how competitive the industry was or how competitive the environment was uh, for that particular business. And it appeared that uh, companies which had squeezed profit margins, uh, that had difficulties, these were the companies most likely to uh, be innovating. And the most likely, and there's also, as you'll see a bit further on, that innovating companies are the companies most likely to be generating productivity growth. So here seemed to be the basis of some explanation as to why, from this period here, which is really the when the global financial crisis uh, hits in 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 great power, here's a bit of an explanation as to why um, productivity, labour productivity, might have taken a big lift upwards. And it's to do with the fact that uh, from about here, uh, business gets exceedingly difficult in Australia. I mean, the mining boom, it's great, but as we'll see a bit later on, the exchange rate is putting enormous pressure on, on uh, Australian business. Uh, the, the, the wealth effects, which, uh, which are, are, are very powerful in Australia, have, have reversed themselves for those who are sort of interested in these things. Um, 
the S&P the ASX 200 closed today at 4373. It, uh, it peaked at 6829 on the 1st of November uh, 2007 and it troughed uh, on the 6th of March at 3146. So the ASX 200 at 6829 was an extraordinary thing. Uh, you can also see that notwithstanding the recovery that has occurred, we're not that far above the actual trough of, uh, of 2000. For those who would like uh, comparisons elsewhere, uh, the S&P 500 in the US, that closed uh, uh, last night at uh, 1457. The peak of the, of the S&P 500 was 1567, about the same time as in Australia on the 9th of October 2007. It troughed at 677 uh, on the, um, on the uh, I think that was the 9th of March uh, 2008. Uh, it's possibly uh, not necessarily, it may be a parable, but uh, the, uh, the S&P 500 supposedly troughed during the day on the 9th of March at the devil's numbers of 666, but uh, uh, traders sort of put a lot of faith in these sort of things. But that is a sort of broad indication of uh, that things have be not been easy along the lines that uh, a number of things have been happening in this most recent period. Obviously, the most marginal firms have had trouble uh, surviving and have exited. But it's better than that. It's not just that we're losing low productivity companies and replacing them with higher productivity companies. It's just that the, the competitive pressures have increased so dramatically in Australia that we are seeing and the companies that are making a fist of it being more productive, using inputs more effectively, and actually being more innovative. So this story here is not all gloom. So then why is the productivity story surrounded by so much gloom? And it comes from, from basically these, these numbers, and it's the multifactive productivity, which is when you go to the trouble and you do try and take account of the labor, and the capital input, I mean, because obviously output is not just generated by labor. It is a legitimate and important uh, thing to want to focus on. I mean, if output is increasing just because you have a very large investment uh, going on, uh, it's interesting to know that. And this chart here, uh, hopefully, is, is self-explanatory. The, um, the horizontals is, is labor productivity. And you can see that uh, this sort of should be reddish. <laughs> That's the capital deepening. In other words, that's uh, some measure of capital growth uh, above the, the need for uh, just to expand output. So that's capital deepening. It's more capital. And this is what's left. This is multi-factor pro um, um, productivity in, in a sense. Uh, it's really in reality what you can't explain. It's what's left over once you've, uh, you've put capital and labored. If output grows by something else, it's this uh, blue line here. So this is what we normally call productivity growth or multi-factor productivity growth. Uh, for those who are concerned about the production function underlying this number, it's the bit that uh, you can't explain by the rest. But what has jumps out of, uh, of this sort of chart and which has been alarming people is the fact that it's been negative. Uh, and it appears to be getting more than negative. And the reason why it's negative, you can see from the chart, is because we have this enormous uh, input from capital. So on the face of it, it does seem uh, indeed disturbing. Um, but on, on another level, it's sort of puzzling too. I mean, why would people be uh, deliberately increasing investment when they expect to be getting diminishing returns from it? And people have uh, tried to come to grips with it. And once you come to grips with it, it becomes less alarming. I mean, I, I think the, the finest piece of work on this area is, is, a, is the work that Dean uh, Parkham, Parkham uh, with the uh, Productivity Commission put out earlier this year. And it, it's easy enough to back away from the sense of crisis that this num these numbers uh, suggest once you start looking at it on a, a sectoral basis, because clearly a large part of this is being driven by the mining sector. And you can think of reasons why uh, a um, why you know, capital would be running ahead of output uh, in, in the mining sector for two reasons. One, there's a lag, and two, uh, with prices so high, it does make sense to substitute a lot of capital uh, for marginal 
uh, returns in, uh, in, in the resources sector, uh, and, it's, and that's underwritten by the very high prices. But notwithstanding all of this, so in other words, the situation isn't as grim as it suggests, and certainly the trend is, 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 uh, is not uh, as dramatic as you should think about, and, uh, and it is legitimate to talk about a rebound in labour productivity, but you still have a decline in labour productivity from the earlier period. And this has, uh, has real implications, and it has real implications for policy, in that uh, all through this 20-year period, and this is a fine Treasury chart that I included in the, uh, in the department's uh, annual report last year. Uh, you may have missed it if you don't um, read a lot of the annual reports of, uh, of the departments around town. But uh, I thought it was worth putting in, in there because uh, it is really a very important chart. Because what it's saying is that Australia and the workforce here has had uh, 1.5% to 2% uh, annual growth in real wages for all this period which is really quite extraordinary uh, for Australia, but also extraordinary for a developed country. There would be very few countries around the world where the average wage has risen uh, by that amount in real terms over this period. And you can understand why there's a community belief that there is an underlying uh, norm in terms of real wage growth of 1.5% to 2% because it went on for 20 years. What people don't fully appreciate is that there are two distinct periods in here. The first period, that uh, that growth in uh, which uh, underpins the one and a half two percent real wage growth is generated by productivity growth. Second period, there's a bit of productivity growth in it, but there's a great chunk of uh, the terms of trade. In other words, Australia has been a, a beneficiary of this extraordinary lift in uh, uh, in bulk commodity prices, and that has been to the benefit of everyone. And a bit of arithmetic tells you that, look, this ain't going to go on. In fact, we've already seen the beginnings of it going down. So in the future, this is not going to be there to contribute. And more than likely, it's going to be a negative. Uh, if the community continues to think that uh, one and a half to two percent real wage growth is the norm, uh, there are going to be problems unless uh, this, this, uh, this is labour productivity, unless labour productivity lifts. Now, this is a com combination of, as you can see from the time period of the of essentially the, the decade of first decade of the century. So it covers that period that we're looking at where there's a low period of productivity growth and a stronger period. The task for policy is to take that strengthening period of labour productivity growth that we witnessed in the last uh, uh, year or so, a couple of years, and make that a trend. Because that's the only way that this all hangs together, is that we have to expand that component there. All right, well look, um, you'll be pleased to know that my charts now speed up a bit. This is uh, uh, an indicator of the size of the shock that uh, the Australian industry is living through. It's, uh, it's the terms of trade effect uh, on the exchange rate, but it's also picking up uh, the, the two other things. This is the, uh, the real, it's the, it's the trade weighted exchange rate. It's a real trade weighted exchange rate, but what it also is based on is unit labor costs. So it's, a, it's not just the, uh, the, the relative price movements in the two countries, Australia and, and our trading partners, it includes uh, what's been happening to productivity. And so there are two whammies here. Australian inflation has been low historically, but it's still been higher than, uh, in, than our trading partners. And our labour productivity has been lower than our trading partners. So this ugly line here, which is the real trade weighted exchange rate, is this, uh, this is a recent Treasury estimate, it's 150. The average, the 100 that you see is the base, is the average since the uh, float of the dollar in 83. And you can see that Australia had this extraordinary period of about 18 years from about uh, the middle 80s to about 2003, when we had sort of super competitive industry here. I mean, this, this is all lying below 100. But then in the space of, um, you know, six or seven years, our relative uh, competitiveness declines by 50 or 60 percent. Now, there are those who say relative prices don't matter, but uh, when you get 50 or 60 percent change in it, you know, dramatic things to happen. And this is why it's why people do or why I talk, why people talk about this extraordinary period of structural change that we're going through, because well, this has catapulted uh, structural change, which you could have expected over a decade, into a couple of years. I mean, companies have just had to adjust to a you know, 50% movement in their relative competitiveness. And look, it's worth just having a quick look at uh, what's been happening in the underlying employment within the industry. 
This is the trend line, which you're probably all aware of. It's the slowly decline in, in manufacturing. Uh, some people just say, well, look, this is a trend line, which is going to zero. Uh, you can see, I haven't put the services on because it's everything else. But you can see that you know mining and, and construction is not particularly large, but it's been growing. I take comfort from the fact that this line now is 8%. Uh, you, can, you can say, well, it's 8% heading for zero. Or you could say that, look, Australia is fortunate that only 8% of the employment is in manufacturing. Uh, we are having to live through a, an extraordinary period of structural change, which affects the manufacturing sector. But you can also say, well, look, there's only 8%. Uh, it's not an ins insurmountable task to, uh, for an 8% uh, uh, allocation to manufacturing to uh, persist. It will have to be a different type of manufacturing, but it is uh, a task which I think the nation can uh, embrace, is that we can uh, you know, put in place you know, policies and structures which enable manufacturing not to continue, but it'll have to be a different manufacturing. You can only um, guess at the, the issues for countries, and a lot of countries are going through structural change, where manufacturing is 15 or 20 percent of the economy, and where they're having to adjust to you know, similar levels of structural change, and they're doing that in an economy which is contracting. We are adjusting uh, to quite you know, major structural forces but we're doing it in an environment where the economy overall is expanding. And you can see what uh, mining and construction has done to aggregate employment. It's been a, you know, a major thing. All right, well, look, that was all by way of uh, a scene setter for why does the Department of Industry, Innovation, Science, Research and Tertiary Education uh, exist. It was announced, uh, the Prime Minister announced the, the new arrangements uh, at the end of December in 2011. Uh, the Department um, has four ministers. Uh, and two parliamentary secretaries. This is uh, an unusual, I mean, for those who are familiar with the Canberra scene and the APS, uh, you'll be aware that uh, from time to time there are administrative changes which move responsibilities uh, around the town. Uh, but this is uh, the first time really that uh, the industry department has also had within it uh, not only innovation and science, but all the universities, the whole tertiary education sector. So we've got university skills and, and vet. So that's a, that's a new uh, lineup uh, for Canberra. And in many ways, it's, uh, it's very similar to uh, what the British do with their Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. That's BIS. Uh, BIS is, uh, as you know, they don't seem to go in for such long names for their departments as, as we do. Uh, but just to sort of uh, complete it a little, BIS is also responsible for universities and science. And that's the parallel, really, with, uh, with dessert. Biz has four ministers, but they have four parliamentary uh, undersecretaries. But um, it's good. It's good. Um, but putting all of this together in one, uh, one department only makes sense if, uh, if the whole is bigger, you know, the sum of the parts. And this doesn't mean that uh, we have to, because I mean, why? Wh I mean, why the logic of this? Why put uh, education, tertiary education, science, and research in with the industry department and the innovation department? Well, the synergy that people are looking for, the logic that puts all of this together, is is industry. It's the links to industry uh, where we're looking for uh, for the big return in terms of co-locating these responsibilities. And that's not to say, and, uh, and this is something that uh, I stress, that's not to say that uh, this is going to work because we're going to subsume a policy in the tertiary uh, education sector, that universities, uh, skills, science and research should be run purely for the sake of industry. That's not what this is about. Um, but what it is about is because all these areas do have links to industry. What this is about is doing justice to that link to making sure that uh, while we're uh, trying to achieve you know, the broader objectives that uh, clearly go with, um, with the, the objectives of uh, universities and science, that we're also making sense of that part which has an industry link. And whereas before it's always been thought that this should be done separately, this is the first time that it's been uh, the view and put into practice that there are actually benefits in having all of this uh, within one um, one department. Now, 
I think anyone who's a bit of a student of institutions, doesn't have to be public sector institutions, can be large global uh, uh, commercial organisations, is that it's, uh, it's very easy for uh, large institutions to compartmentalise themselves. Uh, people seem to like living in silos, it's comfy uh, and uh, you know where you are. And you know, my general attitude to this is that uh, it, if you're going to try and uh, build synergies which come from making the various silos uh, tear down the walls or reach out or work with each other or seek, it needs uh, constant work. It won't, if left to itself, uh, you know, large departments like this with separate responsibilities will naturally settle into, uh, into comfy silos. So my, my message to, uh, to the staff is that uh, we have to do more. If all we've done at the end of this period is you know, kept our silos clean, uh, we will have, in a sense, failed. So, uh, but that requires you know, constant high-level uh, 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 encouragement, uh, oversight, but it also means establishing within the department uh, uh, forms and mechanisms uh, which enable, uh, on, a, on a systematic basis, uh, a proper, not just a proper, but a creative and uh, an innovative uh, set of relationships to grow up around it. So um, this has been something that uh, has been, uh, that the you know, senior members of the, de of the department have been working on. Uh, we didn't rush into it when, uh, when, the, when the, uh, the department was put together at the end of December 11, but we have been working through uh, a process of trying to make sure that we do have the best structure in line. So uh, that's something that uh, um, when we're, when we have it ready, we'll, uh, we'll, we, will, um, we will announce that. So uh, this, is, this is the mission, I guess. Um, this is the task we've been set. This is the objective that, uh, that the department has. And um, it's clear when thinking back to the earlier slides is that uh, lying within the department now is uh, the wherewithal, uh, the key policy drivers for facilitating that structural change that, that needs to take place. Because if Australia is going to, uh, to make a, a sensible fist of the structural change that is underway because of this extraordinary change in, uh, in the exchange rate, it's gonna come from our capacity to, uh, to, to, to use skills, to invest in education, to do clever things with science, and not only that, but to turn those clever things in science into effective and useful research and be able to translate that research into effective and interesting and uh, commercial uh, businesses. So let's start uh, having a little uh, quick look at the, the various uh, aspects of the department uh, that uh, I think we should focus on. Lying within the department because we have the education function, uh, the higher education function and the skills function, is a general interest in participation. Uh, participation is, uh, is driven by all sorts of factors, um, but clearly one of the factors that leads to higher levels of participation is the, uh, this is labour participation, is the skill set that uh, individuals have. Um, if you're not particularly highly skilled, uh, if you don't have uh, credentials, or if you're not an effective uh, participant in, in the labour market, all things being equal, it's likely that you're not going to be in the labour market. And this is a chart that uh, I used in Canada. Uh, one of the things that the, the secretaries do is, uh, uh, which I think is a good thing, we are much more co collegiate than, than we were and we do have uh, formal uh, links and exchanges with uh, secretaries in other countries. And this was a chart that I pulled together uh, for a recent, uh, uh, a recent trip to Canada and, the, and, and um, an engagement with the Canadian secretaries of the department. And what struck me is, you know, why on earth is the uh, participation rate for Canada, why has it been systematically higher than the participation rate in Australia? I mean, the demographics you'd have thought would be not that uh, dissimilar. We must have, you know, similar age profiles and things. And what uh, struck me, and, and it's hard to, to draw simple conclusions from simple charts, but one thing that did strike me as odd was that the Canadians have always had a systematically higher level of graduates. Uh, they're, um, they're the cohort of, uh, of the population that has a university degree in Canada is probably 35 to 40%. We, are, we have set ourselves a target of 40, but we've been more below. 
Uh, our levels of uh, schools have been traditionally lower than in Canada. Uh, so it's tempting to see that, uh, that the difference between these charts has got something to do with uh, the skills that uh, we've invested in uh, over a long period of time in Australia. The fact that, uh, uh, that government policy is now actively directed at uh, lifting the skill base of, uh, of, the, of the population uh, has an, an important uh, an influence, I think, on not only the, the lift in uh, the participation rate, but also uh, where it will go in the future. It's interesting also that that period of very low productivity growth is this period here during the boom when the Australian labour force participation rises quite sharply. Uh, it's interesting to think why, why that happened. All right, well look, uh, it's also interesting to look at this on an individual basis and uh, this is, is a, another a fine chart. What it shows there is the uh, income levels for people to, um, broken down by um, qualification and skills. You can see year 11 or less, lower level vet, year 12, uh, and then higher level vet, and then universities. And you can see that uh, uh, people who do invest in higher levels of skills and uh, university qualifications are remunerated. And uh, the encouraging thing is, well, not only are they better remunerated, but they also have much lower levels of unemployment. The encouraging thing about all of that is notwithstanding the, the very large lift in the proportion of the population that has university degrees is it still uh, it is still a commercial return that uh, we haven't uh, we haven't bid away the, the premium that comes from a uh, university degree just by the fact we have more of them and uh, this is a, an, another way of looking at it um, this is again the ABS data you can um, this is the hours work that goes into the labor productivity numbers but uh, you can also quality adjust those hours to take account of the, the investment in, in, uh, in labor force, uh, in the labor force. And if you obviously, if you inserted that in your productivity uh, estimate, you'd extinguish a large chunk of, uh, of what is left. So in a sense, productivity is very much what we don't know. And innovation, which is a, another key aspect of it. This is a proof statement that innovation uh, matters. You can see that innovating firms are more um, productive, they're more profitable, and uh, they, they do more in the way of structured uh, training uh, for employees, and uh, they spend more on IT. So that's a proof statement that, product, uh, that innovation matters. This is uh, another aspect of, of, of the department. Uh, this is research and development. You can see this is an important input into innovation, but it's not the whole story, obviously. Um, it's research is, is, a, is, is a factor in enabling companies uh, to change the way they do things and develop new products, but it's not everything. Again, it's, there's encouraging news here for Australia. This is Australia here. Uh, the blue dot is where we were in 2001. Uh, so as a proportion of uh, GDP, we've increased it. Uh, we're close to the OECD average. But the thing that you really want to look at is China, um, which is down here. It's uh, something like one and a half. They're heading for two and a half percent of GDP. But this is the, uh, the O1 level. Uh, you can imagine what's going on. They've lifted their, their ratio uh, from about one to one and a half. So what's been happening to expenditure on R&D in China with uh, GDP growing at 9%, so you've got 9% as a base, plus the increase. So there's been an extraordinary growth in uh, R&D in China. And the other one that you might want to focus on is Korea. Again, enormous expenditure, big growth in GDP, rising rates of, rising rates of, uh, of expenditure as a portion of GDP. But it's not all good news. This is... Uh, Collaboration, you can see that uh, even though we are, we spend a lot of money on R&D uh, and research, there's not a lot of collaboration between, whoops, between Australian industry and, uh, and, uh, and higher educational research, and it's particularly low for small to medium-sized enterprises. Now this um, is, is an interesting chart because uh, obviously research is, is at, the, at the heart of a lot of R&D and innovation. Um, people have always been uh, uh, questioning whether we've got our priorities right with research. 
a lot of talk about uh, uh, people doing research in ivory towers. Why don't they research and uh, put their priorities to more applied? You can see that what's been going on over the last um, 20 years is that, uh, that is that we've been spending more of a ratio on uh, on on applied, and that the base. I'm not sure if there is the. This is a base uh, strategic. Um, research has, has been declining, but you can see that we spend a lot of money on, uh, on applied research. Again, universities are often accused of ivory tower priorities, but you can see that what's happened over the last, uh, over the last 20 years, again, has been that the proportion of basic and strategic uh, research has come down, so it's now roughly 50-50. Um, this is an interesting chart because it uh, shows where the, uh, the pure and strategic um, basic research comes from. It comes from the public sector, particularly the Commonwealth. Businesses does not uh, invest heavily in uh, pure and strategic research. And what do we spend it on? Uh, well, there it is. It's uh, medical and health sciences. That's uh, where uh, Australian public sector GERD has been uh, concentrated. This is uh, something that we've been able to put in place uh, in recent years because of ERA. Uh, I'm sure everyone has a view about ERA, but uh, this, is, this is interesting because the, the green is uh, where we can rate our, our research as well above world standard. And the interesting thing there, again, is if you can see that bio biological and clinical research, which is the third one, good healthy green tail, and biotechnic and biological sciences, nice green tail there as well. Um, worrying blue base to uh, social behaviour and economic sciences. Uh, as you can see, if, up here, if you can read it, you can see that uh, suggests that it's well below or below world standard. So, uh, but interesting that the area where we spend most money is the area where we probably have uh, the best claim that uh, we are actually doing not only world class, but above world class. So that's something of a success story. And it's sort of reassuring. This is an interesting chart. It's the, uh, it's the income that comes to you, higher ed, particularly universities, from uh, commercializing research. And that big bar there is medical and health sciences. So uh, we spent a lot of money. A lot of it's uh, top quality. And there has been money coming back to universities. So something of a success story. And when it comes to translation into sort of commercial, or to the commercial size, this is also something of a success story. Uh, this is the market cap of the biotech companies in the ASX. And uh, you can see that uh, it's a healthy growth. And you can remember from those earlier figures is that uh, Australia's uh, ASX 200 sort of peaks around 2008, declines, but comes back to nothing much the market cap of the uh, of the biotech companies has you know continued if anything on the slide upward trend. So 2004, 8 billion. Uh, middle of this year, uh, 24 billion. And you can actually uh, make a make a chart like this one, which says that uh, you know when you relate the the market cap of the biotech sector in Australia to uh, to GDP, Australia can lay claim to having a uh, a a reasonable market presence in biotech and it puts us on a sort of comparable basis to what's in the US. So uh, we do we do have we have managed to um, turn all of that research in health and, and, and sciences. We've been able to achieve world-class uh, uh, research there and we've also been able to translate that into commercial reality. So what I take from this is that, uh, you know, notwithstanding the, the fact that we haven't been able to uh, solve the problem of collaboration, we have, you know, at least a success story here. And so what I'm interested in is uh, identifying, you know, what it is uh, we've been doing right in this sector and to see to what extent uh, we can duplicate that elsewhere. So in conclusion then, let me just... Uh, just um, talk about a couple of the, of the challenges. Um, the department itself, which is um, you know, the Department of Industry, Innovation, Science, Research, and Tertiary Education, the logic that leads us 
to exist, particularly in a world where people do ask me, you know, what, what is industry policy anymore? And uh, the response is, well, industry policy these days is innovation policy. And so that, that is good, but you do need to be able to then explain, you know, what is the, the role of the government? You know, what is the role of, the, of public policy in the innovation space? And it rests on a, a number of things. One is that the market, if left to itself, will under, under invest in research, education and training. And it's these aspects, these particular investments or inputs or what, call it what you like, which are going to be, which are the key drivers of, of structural change in, in, in this country. Um, these are things that uh, will, will help us transform Australian businesses to you know, create products which are more sophisticated, uh, which are research and skill intensive. And it's what we have to do if we are uh, to you know, go on competing and being successful in a world where being able to compete on price is no longer really an option for us. So these are things that uh, the country has to do well. Now it's also, it's also fair to say that Australia is not the only country in the world which is uh, you know, ambitiously embarking on a, on a strategy for innovation which is based around uh, the delivery of world-class science, research and tertiary education. And uh, as I made the point earlier, a lot of countries are spending a lot of more money than we are or we are capable of spending. So there's an enormous pressure on us uh, to be as efficient and to make the best use of the, uh, of the available resources. And you know, one of the, clearly the, one of the most important things that we can do in all of this is to make sure that uh, we, do, uh, we do manage to, to get uh, the best level of interaction between uh, research and science and, and industry. And uh, this means that we have to you know, create structures, uh, work uh, arrangements so that there is an effective level of collaboration between business and with, uh, with research and science. And the other thing that uh, underpins the, uh, the existence of the department is that uh, Australia has a very large number of small to medium sized enterprises. Going back to the Dolman and Groom report, um, they uh, identify the fact that uh, Australia has almost, there's no, almost no other country in the OECD area that has a larger proportion of uh, companies or businesses with fewer than 20 employees than Australia has. So this means that uh, we have a large number of companies uh, which are in many ways uh, incomplete, that uh, there is a public policy role uh, to enhance the capabilities of a whole range of businesses. And as that earlier chart showed, it's this particular segment of Australian business that does not, uh, finds it difficult or doesn't know how to uh, collaborate uh, uh, with uh, higher ed institutions, with research institutions, uh, or um, innovate. So that's, a, that's a, a clear function for the department. And the other area which, uh, and this will be my, my final point, is that uh, it's also pretty clear in all countries, but in Australia in particular, that the risks associated with uh, setting up uh, new businesses, the risks associated with uh, early stage venture capital are so high that it makes the, uh, the likely returns uh, not look that attractive. And it's, uh, it's also reasonable to, to say that uh, the market in that environment uh, where the, the likely returns uh, are doubtful when compared to the risks it's also likely that uh, the market will underprovide in that sector there. So um, why don't I leave it there and I'll use um, the rest of the time to answer questions. So thank you very much. Well, friends, colleagues, uh, let's take 10 or 15 minutes. Just to do a, rarely have a secretary here, so let's uh, take the opportunity to ask some questions. Please just, just identify yourself and, and uh, Yes, uh, this is this is my proof statement that I actually read a lot. <laughs> Tim Hatton from, from the College of Business and Economics. Uh, thanks very much, Don, for a, a very interesting and informative talk. Uh, I wondered if you could say a bit more about the fact that I mean, you've talked about the organisation of the department, you've talked about the um, productivity trends and what we want to achieve and the aspirations that you've got. I just wondered if you could say a bit more about how precisely how that's going to happen. I mean, in an age of sort of fiscal austerity, I guess you're not going to be throwing a lot more money at things. Uh, you've talked a lot about um, collaboration between government, universities and industry. 
But I just wonder if you give, give some, some examples or ideas about how, what the, the sort of methods, the mechanisms, the initiatives, the agendas that are going to follow from this. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I made the point earlier. I think we have, to, we have to be very assiduous and very clever at making the best use of what we've got. Because you did, right? Um, there is not a lot of public money around to uh, invest in, uh, in uh, whole new areas of uh, science or research or um, you name it. Um, a lot of other countries do have that luxury and they're, and they're indulging. So it means that we have to be a lot smarter. And I think that involves uh, identifying what our resources are um, and making the best use of them. I'm also on the, um, the CSIRO board. So I guess um, you know, I've become you know, a lot more familiar with, with CSIRO. CSIRO is a, it's not a unique uh, Australian institution. It's not a unique uh, a lot of countries, or a number of countries, have, uh, have invested heavily in in, uh, in public sector research type bodies, which have uh, a direct brief to engage with industry and, and build uh, successful uh, relationships and strengthen Australian companies. Um, so we're not unique in that, but it is actually quite a large organisation. I think we've got to make the best use of that. Because uh, in a sense, you know, their mission is actually a lot to do with what, uh, what you and I have been talking about. Uh, they've, I think, in recent years, uh, been through a process which has strengthened them. Uh, I think uh, um, I'm, I was, I am fond of telling them that there was a period when uh, there was a view in Canberra, certainly amongst the central agencies, that uh, you know, publicly funded research organisations do have a habit to become uh, sheltered workshops, but the. Um, but CSIRO, I think, has, has actively uh, worked to try and uh, focus on the things that matter. And uh, one of the things that uh, they've put a lot of effort into is, uh, is precincts. And uh, I think there are links back to you know, what we were talking about earlier, about uh, the success of, of health science. I think there's, um, there are momentum effects. There are uh, benefits in, uh, in co-locating things, or not necessarily co-locating, or just having um, similar things done in similar areas or in some form or other. So I think we have to look to, to do clever things there and make sure that, uh, that we've got uh, the best lineup. We, we're actually taking advantage of the opportunities that we have because we have clever research and we can try and make sure that it's not isolated but brought together. Um, so that doesn't necessarily require a lot of resources, um, but it is something I think we can do. I think we've got to make sure we've got the right incentives um, in place for, uh, for research particularly in public funded um, research organisations that uh, we don't want to have uh, our best researchers focus solely on, uh, on, on their career progression which is linked um, to, uh, uh, to peer reviewed uh, academic pieces, not that that's un, 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 uh, not unimportant but uh, we would like them to also, you know, if they were inclined to be entrepreneurial and uh, do things, we wouldn't want the system to actively discourage them from that. So, uh, uh, particularly on the applied side, I mean, it's clear that we spend a lot of money on applied research, but is it the right applied research? Do we have the right incentives in there? Or do we have a situation where, you know, applied research is uh, research you couldn't get through the pure door? Uh, I mean, those sort of issues I think we can come to grips with. They're hard issues, you know, all countries wrestle with them, but uh, that doesn't mean that we can't do a better job. And I think it's made easier because all of these functions are within the department. I think it's, uh, it's easy to have that conversation uh, when you've got the industry there, you've got small to medium sized enterprises, we've, we've got relationships with individual companies. I think it's easier to talk about how do you get individual companies to uh, actually uh, have a relationship with a, with a publicly funded research organisation. So I, that, that's where I'm hoping that we can uh, actually deliver something without spending much money. Um, so my question is about a report uh, released by WIPO and it's about just global innovation. Um, and the report uh, measured the, um, the uh, national innovation um, systems of various countries around the world and it put Australia in 23rd place um, overall and I think it put Australia at about 107th in terms of its uh, innovative efficiency uh, measured in terms of inputs and uh, outputs. So my question is, and that obviously has massive implications for productivity, so my question is, 
do you think that's an accurate assessment of Australia's national in innovation system on the international stage? And uh, if it is an accurate assessment, uh, why why is Australia in this position? Why would you do so badly? Well, look, uh, the trouble with those sort of rankings is that it's very difficult to um, you can you can you know cut and dice them in all sorts of different ways, and uh, uh, on some measures we do a lot better. Uh, but it's clear that on a whole range of things we don't do particularly well. The one that I tend to focus on is the collaboration. Um, we tend to do not that well in that area. So anything which uh, it focuses on that aspect, we tend to rank very poorly. We, we tend to rank reasonably well, uh, it does surprise people a little bit, on ease of setting up businesses and ease of um, ending businesses. Because um, in a lot of countries, it's, it's difficult, you know, the, the, the processes involved in setting up a business are not easy. Um, notwithstanding its difficulties here, uh, it's apparently a lot difficult elsewhere. And in a lot of countries, um, you know, extinguishing a business is actually a very expensive and difficult business as well. So on those sort of things we do quite well. Uh, we do rank reasonably well, as I said, uh, on R&D. Um, but it's, it is possible to, you know, organise all sorts of rankings and on some we look uh, dead ordinary, some we look really woeful, some we look reasonable. I didn't put any of them in here because um, you've got to really know what's in them before you can draw too many conclusions. But it's fair to say there are wide aspects of things that we don't do particularly well. We tend not to rank that well on management type issues. Um, most of the studies will show that uh, we have a very long negative tail in management skills, um, particularly when it comes to small to medium sized businesses. And that is something I think which doesn't stand us in good stead. So I think scale, I think if you're trying to uh, draw some conclusions out of that, I think uh, it's important that not only that we, that we uh, encourage startups because that appears to be uh, positively related with innovation and uh, productivity growth, but we do need to be able to grow those small businesses into medium sized businesses because scale is, is clearly a problem in Australia. Uh, John Scott from the Australian Risk Policy Institute. Um, I'm looking at, at the productivity question uh, through two eyes. One is the wealth creation and, and the tax base. Uh, but the other one is the question of um, the effect of globalization on the whole question of what does productivity actually mean in a globalized environment, um, in part because of the hollowing out <coughs> of agriculture and manufacturing and, uh, and mining, extractive industries, uh, we're shifting an awful lot more into services. But the, the more fundamental question is, if, if we have a, a productivity equation which is anchored in industrial era economics, and we've actually moved to uh, a networked global economy where consumers are free to choose to buy whatever they choose to buy on their own grounds without ever talking to us, um, it doesn't really much matter what happens at the individual firm level if they're not part of global value chains and, and that then comes back to the question of what does Australia do in creating um, an environment for global uh, value chain. And I might add, just coming out of Canada, I visited Canada at the outset of the NAFTA uh, discussions. I spoke with the head of the Ontario Health Department and the economic environment, the way it's structured, uh, indicated that it was $600 per car cheaper to manufacture in Windsor, on Ontario, across the river from Detroit, and that the U.S. government wished Canada to dismantle its health system in order that it did not have competitive advantage. So I, I suspect that the question here is, what do we do as an Australian nation? to create conditions for productivity in a network world um, as a matter of urgency uh, as, as the resource boom is, is of limited duration. We do seem to be actually quite good at services. Um, part of the reason that we had that uh, surge in productivity growth uh, in, the, in the 90s and early part of, the, of, the, of this century was because of um, strong growth in uh, productivity in services, uh, particularly in financial services. And that had a lot to do with early adoption of um, a whole range of you know, ICT and a willingness to uh, reorganize how we do business in the services side. And, 
Uh, I mentioned um, the Secretary's going to, um, to Canada to visit the Secretaries in, in, in Ottawa. Uh, we also recently had the, uh, the Secretaries from Singapore uh, come and visit us here. And that was very enlightening too, because Singapore is highly efficient in a whole range of things. Um, they've got a, put a lot of effort in uh, being globally competitive, participating in supply chains and doing all these sort of things. But they have a not particularly productive services sector. And one of the things which um, did intrigue, I guess, the Australian secretaries was their observation, and it was quite you know, unprompted, was they wished that their construction sector was as productive as our construction sector. And uh, we all sort of, our heads all went up and wondered what the CFMEU was, uh, uh, had been up to all along. But I guess a few moments thought is that uh, if, if uh, if Australian construction companies have to be able to work with the CFMEU and the, and the negotiated arrangements there, uh, they're going to be highly efficient <laughs> at the use of labour. <laughs> uh, and if they are going to uh, build uh, things in Australia, they're going to do it really well. So uh, I think it's a, a mistake to see, uh, to see the productivity story as really just a story about the, the global uh, traded goods sector. I mean, I made the point earlier that uh, on one level, you know, an 8% uh, uh, manufacturing sector uh, it can be a challenge and a worry, but in a sense, 8% is, is 8%. There are 92% of the Australian workforce who are not working in manufacturing. And we seem to be quite good at organising things. Um, that's one of our schools. I don't know whether it's, uh, it's innate or whether it's cultural or whatever it is, but uh, we, I think have you know, approached the services sector just like any other sector, and we've always been trying to, to ride them, ride them, uh, run them uh, effectively. So um, there are things you're right, your, your points about as the world globalises, uh, if Australian manufacturing is going to succeed, it has to have scale. Uh, we're a small market here, you can't be globally competitive in a lot of uh, manufacturing unless you participate on a scale basis, and the only way you can do that is if you are part of a global supply chain. So we do need to be able to develop innovative manufacturing products uh, that not only are competitive, but that can also be sold within you know, a much larger um, you know, global network so that we can get the benefits of scale. <laughs> Andrew McCready from the Australian Services Roundtable. Uh, Dr. Russell, I was very pleased that you spent uh, some time going through the productivity data because I think really are they given the significance that they ought to be given. Uh, and you mentioned in the case of, of mining, uh, a part of the explanation for the, uh, the poor productivity growth was in fact prices have gone up and therefore uh, companies' resources also go up. Uh, as your geoscientist no doubt can explain, uh, and therefore the cost of producing per tonne goes up. So uh, now the reason why that, and that's all very well understood in, um, uh, in uh, mining circles, but the reason why it isn't included in the national accounts is that uh, natural resources are excluded from the nat national accounts. Uh, so uh, the growth in the resource base is not, is not counted when the price goes up. Uh, and there may be reasons for that, but of course uh, that gives you something uh, that's rather confusing when you're trying to relate innovation to productivity growth. Uh, now when you talk about services, if it's uh, not quite as easy as you might expect in mining, services is even more difficult. Yeah, sorry, very quickly. Uh, in uh, retail, for example, uh, the volume of the retail sales is uh, equated to productivity. And in Australia, uh, that volume is about 40% less than the US, and that's why the Productivity Council found that our productivity was 40% less than in the US. Mm. And that relates to the prices that people uh, charge in Australia, uh, really uh, nothing to do with the labour. Uh, component of it at all. Yeah. Um, I, I think scale is, a, is an important issue. Uh, you know, one thing that struck me when I was in the States was that uh, 
is it handicrafts? You'd go to uh, local fairs and and you could buy you know, quite you know, gifted uh, rings and bracelets and what have you at a fraction of the price that uh, you'd buy them in Australia. You know, handicrafts seem to be a lot cheaper in the US, and these are still you know, small scale, one or two uh, individuals, but they would have equipment. Uh, they would have you know, large machines, they would be able to substitute, or they'd be able to get the benefits. And that obviously came from scale. I mean, they may work fairs or have small shops or whatever, uh, but the capacity for them to, um, to actually uh, you know, spread the cost of a, of a bit of machinery uh, was much, much greater there. And the other thing that uh, has struck me is that uh, my, my wife's family comes from Tasmania. Uh, so we do go down there, and it struck me that uh, the price of handicrafts in Salamanca Place is a lot higher than the costs of, uh, of handicrafts in, in Glebe in, in Sydney, uh, which is sort of interesting because wage rates in, in Tasmania are a lot lower than they are in, uh, in Sydney, but it's actually cheaper if you want to buy a bracelet or a bangle, it's cheaper to buy it in uh, Sydney than it is in Salamanca Place in, in Hobart, and I'm sure that's to do with the fact that if you're a even if you're an exquisite designer in, in Hobart, you can only sell you know, a limited number of them, whereas you've got a much greater set. So I think scale is a really important issue for Australia and always will be. Dr. Russell, your department clearly has lead responsibility for the government's productivity and innovation agenda, but uh, obviously there's other departments um, around the APS that have involvement in this agenda. I, for instance, work in the workplace relations function within DEWA, and we've got a strong interest in labour productivity. I was wondering if you think the APS as a whole is well positioned to give a cohesive sort of um, support to the government on a policy challenge such as the productivity agenda, which crosses across uh, uh, sort of department disciplines. Yes, well, look, I mentioned earlier that um, one of the things that has struck me since coming back to Canberra is that uh, the secretaries are, are much more collaborative uh, than, than when I left. Uh, it used to be much more of an adversarial culture at, uh, among secretaries, but um, uh, not now. We we all hang out together. Um, we go on trips together. Uh, oh no, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Well, I, I probably see more of the secretaries than than anybody else in in this town. And uh, um, we do. We have dinners together, and we have dinners with partners. Um, so there's a, there's a measure of uh, collaboration uh, between departments which didn't exist before, which I think is encouraging. Uh, there is you know natural focus because the you know there is a um, you know a productivity committee of cabinet. Uh, it is, I think, helpful that uh, more, of, I mean, you're right, I mean, you know, productivity in a sense is, can, you know, in a sense, almost involve everything. Uh, but you can't have everything in one department because one big department doesn't really work. But, uh, but I think having, you know, a large part of the story in one department is, 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 is very effective and quite useful because I think it does enable, um, enables this department and the people in it to engage, I think, uh, you know, effectively with, with other departments. So I think it's less of a adversarial sort of uh, structure. And because it has become such a, a key, you know, national priority, I think that helps as well in terms of getting uh, people to, to work together. Sure. Uh, Ian Marshall, my name is Manzor. I'm not sure start microphone. Oh, sorry. And I should start with a disclaimer. I've got a deep interest in industry policy, but I'm not an economist. Uh, but I have been looking at some recent developments in the UK. There is a role for non-economists. Sorry? There is a role for non-economists. I think that's true, thank God. Um, but I've just been fo following some of the recent developments in the UK, and it does seem to me that the winds blowing through industry and innovation policy are, in some significant respects, uh, different from the ones that are still conventional wisdom here. I suppose typi typified in the leaked letter of Vince Cables to David Cameron earlier this year, which trans deliberately sought to transcend the sort of picking winners heresy that still seems to exist in Australia, and did focus much more closely on the sort of knowledge ecologies around particular sectors, and did talk about the government deliberately targeting uh, uh, some of its, pri uh, its priorities. And, and then when you talk about SMEs, it's always struck me that Taiwan is the country that's absolutely riddled with SMEs like us, and Taiwan has a very different approach to 
SME management than we do. Uh, uh, so I'm interested in your comments on these sort of conceptual questions. Uh, well, I, th I think with the British, um, I mean, I think, you know, as with all these things, we're wrestling with very similar sort of um, challenges and we come, I mean, I was curious to see the parallels with biz uh, and the, you know, their starting point that there are benefits in having you know, all of these functions within, within one department. But uh, the British, I think, are, are more inclined to, to, to be, take an activist role in, in a whole range of things. Uh, we still, I mean, a major part of the uh, assistance encouragement that uh, we go in for is the R&D tax credit. Uh, which is um, is generic. Um, we're not. Um, we've we've got it, you know, more skewed towards small and startup companies than, than we did. So I think that's good. Uh, but we're not. Uh, we don't have it focused on, uh, you know, particular uh, sectors or, or companies. And that's probably the you know the biggest input. Um, I think the British are more inclined to to have a sectoral approach. Um, they do have uh, a greater. Um, need, I suppose, to, to tailor assistance and policies and support research and whatever to, to particular sectors. I suspect that's got a lot to do with the fact that um, you know, the UK is part of the EU, so they've, uh, they've got a much broader and possibly more competitive market to deal with. And they've also got to deal with a whole range of European countries who also have a, a fondness for you know, sectoral uh, involvement. Uh, but I might also mention that uh, on my trip to Canada, the other thing that struck me was that the Canadians had actually uh, come to the conclusion that uh, generic assistance and support wasn't really that effective. And they had actually scaled back their general uh, tax incentives for R&D in favour of having more activist targeted uh, assistance for particular companies. Uh, we've, we've stuck with the, the generic approach. Uh, and I think given... Uh, Given that the benefits, then if you've got it properly structured, I mean, if, if, if what you're assisting isn't real R&D, then you've got a problem. But if you've got it uh, properly uh, aligned with you know, R&D, I think it is helpful to have you know, non-sector specific um, assistance. And that's certainly been your experience. Alison, one last short question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it will be short. Um, what I took out of the latter part of your talk was the emphasis on science and engineering and a implicit, I think, view that we in Australia could become niche experts in things like biotechnology, which I think is, is wonderful and I really like that idea. But one of the um, essential underpinnings for Australia to continue to develop in science and engineering is to attract really bright young girls and boys from secondary school level into science who can then go on to university and stay in science and not leave. And we know that quite a few women leave science, for example. So I would have thought in terms of policy, there would be, and we know we're in a time of very scarce resources, so we have to target mm. policies perhaps, would be to think of ways at secondary school lev level of encouraging, perhaps financially, kids into science, mm. and at tertiary level to offer scholarships into science in order to have this human capital basis of education to carry us forward. Mm. So I wondered what do you think of that? Well, we have... Um we have Professor Chubb on the ninth floor who uh, stalks the whole building uh, uh, telling the story uh, uh, that you're telling as well. So it's a recognised um, challenge and it's also something that uh, um, that people do focus on. I mean, it's, it is a worry when, uh, you know, when kids don't have that sort of excitement and enthusiasm for maths and science because you know, that's the, the input into you know, a whole range of um, areas where we do have to do well at. Uh, again, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but I can, all I can say is that, uh, you know, living within the department is a, is a, is a fine uh, uh, 
catalyst for, for change and to the extent that uh, there are resources and things that can be done, it's certainly an objective um, to, to do clever and better things with, with kids and, and science. We'll let Don Russell uh, declare victory. <laughs> uh, please join us for refreshments and, and join me in thanking you.